What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Yala. Ba, 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 ba. Your thrice weekly podcast where we talk about the hottest news with a touch of what, Terrence? Good old humor. Good old humor, man. Yeah. It's the start of the week. Uh episode of the of the week. Start of mm. the week podcast. Mm. Start is the start of the week. It's the start of the week. And what was your end of week last week? Uh I mean today's Halloween. So oh, yeah, uh, today is Halloween. It is Halloween. Uh thirty first you know, October. Yeah. A lot of uh people wearing costumes, uh in various places you went to over the weekend. Uh mm. did you dress up for Halloween? Uh no no no, I didn't. I no. didn't. Right now, your wedding, right, your right wedding, now, honestly, your wedding suit, everything. You never try on uh, over this weekend. I mean, some some parts are still in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, for the longest time, I always thought, okay, planning a wedding, how stressful can it get? Mm, mm, um, mm. I am eating the words back now. Like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then and then yeah, yeah. the whole ang pao, I'm eating the words. The whole ang pao thing. Also, are you eating your words on that as well? No, 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 fuck that. Yeah. <laughs> fuck the market rate, Ang Bao. No. no Am I, we until your wedding, wedding. We until your wedding night, then we ask you again. <laughs> okay. No, it has to be the first podcast after the wedding. Ah, yes. Then yes, you ask me ask my thoughts. Yeah. After I've done all the calculations, really. Yeah. Then, yeah, yeah but it's just the nitty gritties of the wedding that, that I think it's less about the organizing of the event itself. Mm, it's mm. everything else around it. All the emotions and all this other shit. Mm, family and, and yeah, family, just handling everyone's yeah. emotions, all right? Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it is what it is. Weekends are now just weekends and mornings and nights are like pre work, post work. Yeah. Yeah. But non-stop. you can't deny you can't deny it gives gives you and your partner and some objective to work towards, like, right? Every weekend. Like, true, like, yeah, true. It feels like true. much more like a, a, almost a mission that you all have to accomplish together. Yeah. It's right? training for every challenge that marriage is gonna hand us. Mm-hmm. This is training. Right? Mm-hmm. Weddings wedding is for training. Yeah, you yeah. know, wedding is just a sugar-coated way of uh, marriage training. Yeah. But the yeah, crazy thing is, is, is entirely, it's a problem that you create yourself, like, right? Yes, it's exactly. Entirely, exactly. It's entirely a problem that you create yourself then, and then now you have to solve this problem yourself. Like. <laughs> yeah, That's exactly. the funny thing about it. Like. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a training exercise in army, right? Mm. You create this false attack yeah. uh, to train yourself so that when the real attack comes, yeah. and to me, that's what a wedding is. Mm. You're creating this you're entirely exactly right. You mm. are creating this thing mm. which you haven't realized yet is training. Yeah, training. yeah, yeah. And then at the end of it, you're promoted to general. Mm. You straight away become general. Like you're the general. You self-promote, self-promote. Yeah, self-promote. <laughs> you're the general of your relationship, <laughs> basically. And and then uh, uh, you, know, you, you have all the battle scars and everything just from a self-created, self-created exercise, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean it's it's sweet and like I think my fiance might be listening in so it's yeah, you know it's sweet, it's oh, wonderful, okay. it brings families together. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll take the we'll take the rest of the the critique offline and then and talk yeah, through that. Take, yeah, yeah, correct. <laughs> correct, correct. But yeah, but yeah, it was a well, it's a it was meant to be a very big party weekend for everyone, uh, but I think yeah, like, like our our topic suggests it's not it's not it's going to be a bit more somber than that, uh, right? It is, man. It is. Um, and but, but I mean, before we we dive into that topic, mm. we do have one other thing to to say to our listeners. And what is that, Terence? Yeah, I mean, usually we just you know uh, plug something that we've been doing and all that. But I think we the, towards the cl- towards the end of the year and everything, we start thinking about how and our, how and when our podcast uh, can evolve to other ways, other things like because I think we've built up a very strong community. Uh, for this podcast, not only uh, to, to the listeners, but also the active, you know, participants on Reddit who comment and post stuff about the podcast. Uh, and we always thought, is there another way that we can also bring this community to, you know, to a new place and to do things together? And uh, what's one of the ideas that we talked about? Eh? Um, it is the idea of a newsletter. Mm. Um, and, and I think it stemmed from our own... Um, uh, realization that if you if you find a good newsletter, there can be actually a lot of value. Mm, and mm. I mean, for me personally, like I follow pages on Instagram, Facebook, and stuff. But sometimes it's too much. A newsletter, your email inbox feels like the last place where you can at least fight the algorithm. You know, if you mm. subscribe to this newsletter, they send out an email, you get it. There's no ranking or some shit. It's just as primal as it can be, and and mm. that's what I've come to really like, lah. Yeah. 
And I, I think that's what we we've enjoyed about uh you know you're using Reddit, right? It's a much more feels like a much more direct connection between us and the mm. people who listen to this podcast. Uh, but we yeah. felt we feel like maybe we could take it a step further. Maybe we, our relationship could take one step one step further. Uh, not not towards full on marriage here, like, like how Harish is doing. But we just take a step mm. further into maybe cozying up in your inbox as well, like you know, like uh once a week or something like that. Because I think we yeah. we, we discuss a lot of things that people enjoy listening to. They enjoy discussing over dinner with their friends subsequently. Um, but maybe there's an easier way for us to get that information to you rather than having you to come come and find it through you know, some social media algorithm or anything. Lah. Yeah, yeah. Because right now, if you want to find out the article links or one shock thing link, you have to find the episode, check the the description for the links. So mm. we just have some ideas on, okay, how to how to make that a little more like like a consolidator. So, mm-hmm. so we have some ideas, but we also want to throw it out there, man. Like yeah. um, um, we are going to be launching a newsletter and if you have any crazy ideas on what you would like to see mm. uh, in it, we're gonna start a Reddit Reddit thread, uh, and just crowdsource the shit out of like your thoughts and ideas. Like. Yeah, it doesn't have to be a absolutely crazy out there idea. Maybe it's just yeah, even just wanting to to consolidate all our one shot things for the week or something like that. You know, uh, that's that's something mm. we talked about because I think one shot things always at the end of the episode, and uh, you know, like we know what the completion rate for each of our our episodes are, and sometimes some people they don't get to experience that one shot thing because they. They're not able to get to the end. Lah. So maybe it's be easier if we just feed it to the inbox or something. Lah. Yeah, yeah. So that's one of the ideas we have. Mm. And we are hoping to launch it like uh, in the coming months. But mm. yeah, we just want to hear if there's anything in particular you want to see or you think would be nice lah, or anything you've seen in other newsletters which you think, oh shit, mm. a Yalabot version would be epic. Just uh, put, share your comments on the, in, at the Reddit thread link below in, yeah. the, in this episode description. I mean, on Instagram also, like, if you want to DM us and all, mm-hmm. just go ahead, man. Yeah. All right. Cool. We will okay. get into awesome. our first topic, huh? which is, it's a heavy yes. one. Heavy one. It is a very heavy one. Um, and I guess, I mean, I'm sure that if you're listening, uh, you probably have heard about it already. Mm. Um, it is the, the horrible tragedy that happened uh, in Itaewon, mm. uh, South Korea. Mm. Uh, regarding a stampede, la, mm. uh, a, mm. a crowd crush where at current count uh, at about 2.30 p.m. on 31st October is 154 dead. Damn. Wow. 154 dead. Yeah. Um, and I mean, right now, it's still a, it's still a developing case. It's mm. fucking horrible. Mm. But mm. When, when was the first instance that you heard that there's, there was something like this happening? Uh? Uh, I think when we woke up, on on was it, it happened on Saturday night, right? On Saturday night, so mm. yeah, waking Sunday up. Sunday night. Sunday night. Was it a Sunday night? Sunday night was just last night. Yes. Right? Yeah, yeah, correct, correct. No, it's not Sunday night. Oh, Saturday, it's Saturday night. night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Saturday, Saturday night. night. Ah, yes, yes. Saturday night. Also, waking correct. up in the morning on Sunday, and uh, just reading about the news, I think uh, yeah, it was quite quite shocking. Uh, and yeah, I mean, how about how about you? When do you when do you first hear about it? Uh? Uh, it was Saturday night. Um, I think when I was just on Twitter, uh, mm. looking at football scores, mm. um, I saw Itaewon trend, and I was like, "Oh, mm. what's mm. going on?" And it was the early rumblings of like, uh, no, was it Saturday night? Yeah, it was around Saturday night because the mm. time zone between us and Korea is is relatively similar, lah, Right, so it would mm. have been Saturday night, and I was like, "Oh shit!" And the first thing I saw was some a very graphic video. That made me almost feel like, is this real? Mm. It was um uh I mean, okay, if you're listening, just if you just trigger uh, warning. Trigger warning, just just cover your ears if you it'll be like 15 seconds, but it, it was just a video of this crowd of people administering CPR to a bunch of other people on the street. Mm. It mm. was it was fucking just I was like, what is this? It, it looks like it's too surreal a scene to be real. Yeah. And that was when I, of course, in my mind, I was like, wait, is this some from a video from a, a, a past or something? But yeah, mm. it was, yeah, then yesterday you see the news come out and, and the latest mm. updates and it's it's crazy. Like, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, I there was a lot of disbelief initially for me as well. Like, I was just thinking, how could it be that just uh, people crowding a street, you know, on the on a Halloween, Halloween party night, right? How could it be that yeah. so many did? We're talking about 150 did at one go like it can't be that bad right you know um yeah 
I was like, there must be, uh, in fact, the, the thought crossed my mind that there must be something more to it. Like, was there drugs or some, you know, some explosion or something that, that caused people to, 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 uh, to die? La. But um, no, man, it was entirely, like you said, the crowd surge that caused it. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, we, there's been a lot of news about it in the past 24 hours and uh, a lot of uh, reckoning that needs to be, uh, the reckoning uh, from, from the South Korean government and everything about how something like that happened. Uh. But uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, essentially that I, I'm also starting to understand the difference between uh, what what you call a stampede and so a so called crowd mm. surge uh, or crowd crush. Mm. Uh, do you mm. do you already know the difference between the two? Yeah, yeah, I came across some articles explaining it. Yeah. Um. So, but maybe before you go into that, if I can just give a bit more context. Okay. Um. Because yeah, like um, I mean, Itaewon. If, if you haven't been to South Korea, like I haven't. Uh, but it it's a very trendy area la. It's mm, full of mm. bars and and apparently COVID hit hit the place hard. But now there's a resurgence after a lot of newer restaurants and bars took over like a uh, shady shit la. Mm. I think it was cleaned out and it's, it became like cool and uh just like a party central la. Mm. And this Halloween event was the first event uh since first Halloween event since like pre pandemic mm-hmm. and also the first uh public event that didn't require masks. Mm. So, yeah, so there were estimated but we, like... But when you say it's an event, like, it's not an official event, all right, to clarify. Uh, yeah, correct. It is not, it is not an official event, yes. Uh, no, but there were, it was a 2022 Halloween festival. Was it? A, really? There was a festival. Oh, there's a yeah, festival there, going there, on. There was a festival because that's why there were, like, police uh, officers uh, uh, there for crowd control, uh. Mm, mm. Um, or at least that's what it says um, in the current right now is the one of the articles I'm reading it's a yeah Halloween festival or maybe Halloween festivities yeah um, I think it's, it's, it's more it's just almost... festivities because the, the street as I understand oh, is, is like okay, a, okay, okay. it's like a party area like, it's like a it's a club key or something like that right oh okay okay yeah okay so yeah so yeah it's actually yeah I, uh, thanks for pointing it out it's more like clucky mm. where there's a lot of Halloween things going on but mm. there's just a crowd uh, that gathers mm. and you see crowds in clucky but the thing about Itaewon it's it's a street that is in, it has inclined streets so mm. if you've ever been to Hong Kong or I think even like uh, Harajuku in, uh, in Japan those sort of streets where you have like a main road and then you have these alleys that go downwards and upwards lah Mm. So, apparently, most of the deaths are in one particular alley, which is inclined. And mm. also, apparently, it was some mention that there may have been a celebrity at one of the bars or something kicked off a rush from a certain crowd of people and that triggered an entire, like, uh, crowd crush. Mm. Mm. So, that's, so right. that's what that's what I've gathered so far. But have you, have you heard anything else? Um, I think there's... Uh... But I think what we've heard is that there are there are foreigners in that crowd, the, the amongst the people who died as well. Uh, no Singaporeans, mm. thankfully, but there were Singaporeans who were in the crowd, also there to party uh, for Halloween. Um, but yeah, it was it's just a uh, something that happened very quickly, and, and I think so, that there's a couple of articles out there that a bit more in uh, you know give a bit more information about the exact location where things happened because I think that whole area. Uh, the bunch of alleys, there are a lot of different bars and everything there, but it was one main alley where most of the uh, most mm. of the casualties occurred. Uh, because And that alley, like you said, was a, a very tight, four meter wide alley. And it was sloped, mm. uh, it sloped quite uh, steeply downwards, uh, yeah. which, which uh, led to, you know, people, uh, to, to that to the crowd crush that, that went on there. Uh, plus the fact that, you know, alcohol was probably being served and, and, People are probably drinking around the area as well, so the roads might have been slippery as well, lah. Yeah, and and that's something you don't see in Singapore, right? But if you go to Hong Kong or or when you walk down, it is quite a surreal thing, lah. You know, you're mm. going literally from one level of the street to another, mm-hmm. um, and yeah, it was about forty five meters long. So, the so just four, now you mentioned four meters, that, four meters wide, four meters wide. Yeah, yeah, forty five meters long. Oh, 45 meters. Long. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah forty five meters long, four meters wide. So yeah. it's not that wide, lah, right? It's no. almost like Haji Lane, maybe you know, like Haji Lane yeah. in Singapore. And 45 meters uh, not even that, that long, man. 45 meters really is like, it's like you can see, you can throw a stone from one side to the other, right? Yeah, yeah. 
So so just now you you mentioned the difference between a stampede and a crowd crush. Mm, what mm. have you realized that? Uh, from what I understand, stampede is when uh, people have the space to run, and they they end up you know like uh, crashing with each other, running over and stamp you know stamp literally stampeding on each other. Uh, crowd crush is where the, the the crowd actually doesn't have have the space to to run, and they're all just like like the name implies like bunched together, and then when one group of people fall down the entire crowd almost like falls down together uh onto mm. each other la. and and it's a much more uh yeah i mean it, it's all of them are scary but but this one is it's like literally yeah, la, the crowd is crushing you rather than people stepping on you uh while running past you la, right mm-hmm. that's my and, and should, understanding yeah. of it la. yeah yeah, because there's actually a a, a a surprisingly detailed Reddit post from I think seven years ago. I think mm. maybe you saw the same one um, by this fluid dynamics researcher mm. who talks about how beyond a certain density of humans, right? Mm. Any group of human behaves like a liquid. Mm. Like it sounds so ridiculous, but what he means by behave uh, like a liquid is that I think beyond 12 people per square meter, mm. uh, which sounds like a fucking insane number, um, you can you can't control how you move anymore, mm. and if you fight mm. it, you will be just thrown around. Yeah. So yeah. so if there's a push at one end, the wave will travel through just like a wave travels through water, yeah. and you will you will flow with it, mm. Um, and it's it's fucking crazy, lah. So so when you said you know the the people uh, like dying from suffocation in a crowd crush. The most morbid thing is you get crushed while standing up. Mm, mm. I think in my mind it was like, oh shit! That means people fell and people were kind of piling on top of each other. No, but in a crowd crush, you you don't even fall. It's so mm. compact that you are crushed while standing up. No, yeah. How yeah. fucked up is that, man? Yeah, I mean, uh, don't don't look don't look it up. But there are videos that out there of uh, you know, not not say close ups, but much clearer. You you see much clearer what was going on with amongst the people in the alley standing up la. and uh yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's quite harrowing to watch that uh you know there are some people especially people who are not tall not not that much taller than everyone else right or even shorter than everyone else it's uh you literally see them almost like like drowning into the crowd la. like sinking to the yeah. crowd you know as the crowd surges yeah. you know so yeah don't look it up don't don't watch it if you're it's not it's not for the faint of heart you know it's a very uh, obviously now we know what happens it's a very gruesome image or, or, or use a video of what or pre, that pre, pre, the prelude to what will happen uh. um, yeah. but yeah I mean, uh, when, when, I mean there's a lot that you can find on social media uh, about the, the incident you know uh, eyewitness accounts and even accounts of people who were in the crowd themselves but one thing I did want to ask you at the very start as well was uh, have you ever been in any kind of like crowd crushing kind of situation uh, where it's such a big group of people that you're literally almost lifted off the ground as you as you move uh. Uh, I think the only thing that comes to mind is when I was young in Tampines mm. and the first Sogo was opening at the first shopping mall uh, in Tampines Central because you know now mm. there's Tampines Mall Century Square there was a Sogo departmental store and I remember the whole of Tampines lost it uh, mm. and I was mm. maybe about nine or something and there was an opening there and I remember that was the first time I was like, oh, fuck, like, this is scary. Mm. Um, also because I, I was a kid. La. Yeah. But As in you were below, you that, were below the, the crowd, la, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, yeah I was below oh, the I crowd. See, I see. Uh, oh. And I was freaky. La. Apart from that, I don't know, like, crowds like that always unsettle me. Mm. Uh, I've never been in a mosh pit. Uh, yeah, I've yeah. been at a concert and all, but I never like being... I would rather stand further back and have more space to move than being all the way up front. Mm, mm, yeah. Yeah. What about you? Uh, I think there have probably been a couple like New Year's Eve parties. Uh, like, you know, On the street, or, is it? Yeah, Orchard Road or you know that kind of thing that I've been for that have uh, you know had crowds like that and then people want to move in one direction and then you're trying to move the other direction and everybody just ends up bunching together. But, but, I would say never to the point where I'm I'm lifted off the ground. I'm you know I'm not a small guy, so for me to be lifted off the ground means it must have been really packed. Uh, but never to that extent. Uh. So, yeah. But but even like like you, I also it, it gets quite nervous, quite quite scary when you're in that kind of situation where you can't move forward, you can't move back, you can't do anything. You just 
you know, and then everyone's breath is on each other's shoulders and, and, and it's hot, sweaty bodies. It's just, it's not, not a fun situation, lah, right? Yeah. And, and like, you know, the eye account, uh, with, uh, eye, eyewitness accounts and just talking to people who were there, there were quite a few of them who said that the crowd was already reaching unsettling densities. Mm. Um, mm. And they managed to get out because mm. for them, okay, like this, this is an accident waiting to happen. Yeah. Uh, of course, like we hear from them, they survived. Mm. But that is also leading to a lot of calls from parents or even the people of Seoul uh, asking, how was this not foreseen? Mm. Uh, there were mm. apparently just 200 plus police officers for crowd control. Mm. And yeah, you know, especially in recent times, even at stadiums, I think recently there was a, there was a tragedy in Indonesia, right? At yeah, a football game. football stadium, yeah. With a stampede. So, so crowd control is a real threat and that Reddit post also uh, pointed out that, you know, as we get denser and denser cities, mm. um, as, you know, like uh, more people start to gather in higher numbers, uh, this becomes a real threat, la, mm. you know? Mm. I think everyone's familiar with, oh, you know, building the fire escape or like when you go on a plane, you almost are programmed from young that, okay, this, there's an escape route if a fire happens, this is, but with crowds, right? Mm. It's rarely ever a, a focus. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's the million dollar question that I think as we, you know, get more details about what happened and, uh, and more understanding of like what was the situation on the ground, you know, in the next 24, 48 hours, right? Uh, the question mm. is how much, I mean, maybe this might be a question we'll be debating for a while. Uh, how much liability do the authorities have in an instance, in a very, very unfortunate uh, accident like this. I mean, uh, uh, has they call it accident? A very unfortunate incident like this, lah, right? How much liability should the uh, you know the authorities, the city, the the, the police force, and the authorities like, in general, how much should they have for something like that happening? Because I think the argument yeah. on one side is that, uh, you know, all these are young people. They're out to party, and you know, like, it was just kind of like unfortunate. They saw a crowd, but they decided, oh, maybe it'll be it'll be okay, or it'll even be fun to some extent to actually merge with the crowd and just go through, go with the flow. It's, I mean, it's, this is our first party in three years, Halloween, everything. Uh, you know, nobody would expect it to be so tragic uh, an ending. Like, they, they would think, oh, if it gets too crowded, I'll just, like, you know, move out to the side or a bar or something. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, how much blame would you place on the authorities here? Wow, that is a tough question, man. Because, I mean, I, I do feel that they are answerable to certain things. Mm. Um, because like I would what, imagine like what, if... What certain like, things? Like, like, okay, I, I, w I would imagine there has to be some sort of protocol or, or, or how you say, pr like best practices if a crowd is starting to form in a public space. Mm. Um, I mean, I've never worked in civil service. I've never worked in enforcement. But it feels like something that is big enough an issue to at least have some... Like, okay, you know this might happen. Mm. What do you do when a crowd is reaching this size? When a crowd is this? There's, there's riot police, there's, there's all that. So it feels like that if this was gathering uh, to that extent, feels like something would have to, would, would ideally be activated, lah, you know? Mm. Mm. So I think that's, that's one thing I would say is, uh, okay, they, they can't be totally devoid of any responsibility, lah, but, but for you? Uh, yeah, I think especially because of everything we've been through the last two years, right? With COVID and, and, and super spreader events and things like that. I think it's, we, we know the danger of people being in very, very, very large groups, like, right? Uh, not, just, not just something as extreme as a crowd crush or a stampede, but even just like, something like COVID spreading through, the, through groups of people very easily, like, right? So mm. to me, it's like, uh, I think, uh, it's something that as much as you cannot anticipate something so devastating happen, you know, happening, right? But it's still something that can be, it needs to be planned for, like, the possibility of, of a, a big, something going wrong when big groups of people gather together. That can, can and should be planned for, especially when you've got all the ingredients for something like this, for, like this crowd crush to happen. Like, you've got, you know, uh, people who are starved of partying for three years. You've got alcohol in, a, in, a, in this whole vicinity. You've got small, very tight alleyways that can only fit that many people. Um, and and yeah, you, you know that 
there's going to be a crowd there that evening. La. So, uh, they, they, maybe there needed there needs to be more active steps taken to assess the you know the the the, 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 the possible dangers in the situation and like what you said maybe even protocols for uh, the clubs and the bars that are around the area because I think there's a lot of uh, reports that a lot of the clubs and bars in the area they were even not not letting people go in right for a while they were because they mm. were they were just like closing the doors and saying oh you can't come in because we're full already and all that, whereas where it could have actually saved a couple of people's lives if they had that open their doors earlier to let people go in, that right? So mm-hmm. there's also maybe for for the club owners and all, there's also that protocol like oh if it gets too crowded we'll just close the doors, which which in in retrospect uh it feels like oh, that's like a very inhumane thing to do la. Like there are people literally dying at your doorstep la, right? Um yeah. so yeah, there's all these things that that I think. No, no particular individual can can plan these things by themselves. But if you are the person in charge of safety and security in the city, and that's your job on a day to day basis to help to avoid, um, you know, worst case scenarios like this, right? Then I feel like the last two years have, has should have given you enough training to anticipate some of these issues, really, lah. Uh, especially with like understanding that how crowds, you know, how you know super spreader events or diseases, and then how big crowds can. Can lead to very unintended consequences la, of to work that that can harm public health. La. So yeah. it's not an excuse to just say, oh, you know, we never foresaw this happening and it's a freak, it's a freak event that one happens once in a lifetime and all that things like that. La. Yeah, but but then I think it's also like just looking at it from the other way. I think mm. let's say if you are in civil service or enforcement, I mean enforcement at any kind, even if you are you have been in event ma- management before or you have Mm. kind of been a school prefect or something. It's yeah. never fun to be the enforcer, la, right? Mm. Of course, when there's a risk, if someone has a gun, it's very clear. This guy is fucking going to wreck some havoc. Mm. But for things that are not a problem until it's a problem, right? I mm. think there's a lot of challenges there also. La. For for the enforcement individuals, I mean, okay, if you look at the pictures of the crowd before the crowd crush, mm. and you look at pictures of, I don't know, the New Year's Eve party in New York, you know, mm. I mean, those New Year things also get fucking packed, you know? Mm. Um, mm. So so I think it didn't seem like it reached a point that we have never seen before. It looks like a, a festival on the street. Mm. Um, of course, this one, maybe with slope streets and all, uh, it has additional challenges. But even for the for the small clubs and bars, I think... Yeah, like on hindsight, like they maybe could have played a bigger role. But if you imagine you're a bar owner on a night where your business is supposed to be like great, you want to max it out, COVID has been fucking hard for you, mm. the crowd is there and you also want to protect the customers in your bar, mm. as selfish as it sounds. It's almost like, okay, I close the door. There's never been an issue outside that that the authorities couldn't deal with. So why the fuck I care, you know? Mm. Yeah. So that's why I think it becomes very tricky for them because... Could they have played a more bigger role? Sure, but wow, at that moment, right? Mm. Tough, man. No, I, so I'm not. Right. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not laying the blame at the the owners of the bars and everything, lah. That I, I think mm. the the blame I'm laying is more about the protocols in in an event like this, lah. Firstly, firstly, were there enough like you know, uh, uh, you know, enforcers put like police or or, or crowd crowd management measures in place like, beforehand. Because if you think about, you mm. know, those things like what you mentioned about like the New Year's Eve party in New York and all that, I think uh, there's a lot of, they close off a lot of roads and there's a very heavy poli- mm. uh, pol- uh, presence of police officers from the get-go. Like. So I don't know how many there were in Itaewon itself and all, but it, it seems seems quite clear that it was quite inadequate because a lot of on-the-ground accounts were that the EMTs were even asking for passerbys to help with the CPR because there just weren't enough uh, people on hand to help, right? Um, yeah, and yeah. So, questions like, you know, did they even uh, what, did they even think that it was a priority to, to you know, put authorities there and, and manage the crowd? Because I, I say this because in Singapore, uh, I remember very clearly the moment, like, the COVID measures were, uh, a lot of the things were lifted, right? COVID measures. And then Club Key was mm. allowed to open again and all. I drove by, I think it was like Merchant Road, um, that area and I saw like oh, this was a Friday night and I saw four huge like riot police vehicles parked by the side of the road la. you know the kind that really mm. like controlling riot la. and this was the first night that, that bars were opening up again and all that so, so it was 
So at least to me, it was like, I was like, wow, isn't that like kind of overkill just for people partying? But in retrospect, probably, you know, they, they were anticipating that there would be, uh, uh, you know, quite a rowdy crowd, you know, people who have been starved of going out for a long time, you know, and they needed to be, they rather err on the side of like having more uh, presence of, of police than less, lah, right? Um, mm, so mm, mm. to me, these are things that uh, are all come, in, come within the purview of, of the authorities foreseeing issues and things like that. I'm not saying that they need to be able to tackle every freaking thing. Like if there was a, you know, a heavy rain and a flood and all that, like a crazy once in, once in a lifetime flood. Of course, that's hard to, to prevent that. But, but knowing that it's Halloween, knowing that it's the first Halloween party after restrictions are lifted and, and all, maybe there needed to be a bit more of these things in place. Now. Yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, even in Singapore, because I think the tricky thing here compared to like the New York uh, New Year's Eve festival is that that one is almost, I'm guessing there is a, there's, a, there's one overall entity that oversees that, given that it's the mm. New York uh, Countdown Festival, right? But this one, like what you said, it's a, it's a con aggregated Halloween festivities that happen to be close to each other, right? like Lucky, mm. right? Mm. So then who is responsible, right? Mm. In Clucky, if shit goes down, um, you can't say, oh, Clucky is responsible. Um, I think the, the one thing that comes to mind is, you know, in Singapore last year, New Year's, there was a gathering at Clucky that was mm. uh, illegal, uh, right? Yeah. Uh, but I think there were, there were safety distancing ambassadors and enforcement that were, had been deployed to Clucky mm-hmm. in, right. like, like in anticipation of these sort of crowds gathering. Uh. Yeah. Um, but also, I think, like, you know, the comparison to, of humans to becoming fluids, it's, it's also morbidly relevant because if you think about floods, right? Uh, mm. Singapore is probably one of the few cities in the world where we don't routinely, routinely get floods and all, but we have been seen more and more late, lah, right? Yeah. It's just one of those things that is never a priority until shit happens. Compared to countries mm. where uh, floods happen often or even in Japan where there are earthquakes that happen often, the buildings kind of are built for that, lah, right? Mm. With mm. floods and freak events like this, uh, it's just, wow. Like, I'm sure there's going to be a whole bunch of protocols that will be kicked in or like studied or reviewed around the world like, because this is mm. fucking horrific. Like. Yeah. So I, I think if anything to, to take away from this is that uh, crowd control is something that uh, countries or cities need to, to plan for like, mm. and not just think about how, how densely can we pack, you know, millions of people into our population. And, and because, I mean, the, the truth is in Singapore, we have started to see uh, especially like prior to the pandemic and all that, right? There, a lot of things were getting a lot more crowded, like, right? Whether it was public transport or, or events, big events, or, you know, like just going to, um, say, the museum or town on the weekends and things like that. So so crowd control becomes a much bigger part of, of everyone's planning like, that they need, need to be aware of. And, and yeah. you know, we were joking about it earlier about, about how your wedding is like a, a military mission that you had to come out with fake exercises for, right? I mean, yeah. that, that's what the exercises are for, right? To prepare for for freak freak events, uh, kind of like what just happened, and 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 to to the best of your ability and your knowledge to uh mitigate such disasters, uh. uh so yeah, I I do I do feel like um hopefully all the governments also all around the world also study this very closely and 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 yeah like, in, in this tragedy also think about the potential dangers as you pack more and more people into your cities as well. Yeah, man. It's just, yeah, yeah it, it's a, as much as you consider fire, you got wet weather plan, this crowd control it has to be like a, a critical cornerstone of like any event planning nowadays, yeah. Mm, mm. And especially yeah, with COVID and all. Crazy. Yeah, COVID, you squeeze a lot of people into a place and then it's a super spreader event, everyone gets COVID and all, you know. These things are, are real, like, they're real and they happened in the last two years. So it's not like it's yeah. uh it's not like crowd control planning. It's like this completely new field to ev- to everyone also, like, right? Yeah, man. Yeah. yeah, it's just it's crazy, man. And I mean, there's only going to be more and more news coming out. Um, mm. I'm bracing myself for more gruesome shit that's coming out, or like the numbers, the final mm. numbers of people who have uh, unfortunately perished, lah. Yeah, and I Jalak, think another Jalak. yeah another interesting oh no not interesting like, another very morbid statistic is that the ratio of uh, I mean amongst the deaths like, the ratios of uh, females to males is like almost 2 to 1 uh, oh is it yeah and I think 
the 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 I mean it's it's still not I wouldn't say it's very hardcore science or anything like, but people the, the the researchers all have postulated that it's because uh you know women generally they have more mass in their upper bodies. So when when the crowd uh surge or crush happens, there's a lot more mass pressing on their on their lungs, uh, so it gets even Ooh. harder to breathe. Uh, that's one aspect, but pl- plus also because men are generally physically stronger in upper body, so they can lit- more literally claw their way out or push their way to get more air as they in, in those situations. And uh, yeah, like also men because generally men are, are taller than women, so being taller in that situation actually does uh, gives you a bit of a a a bit more chance to survive as well, uh. Yeah, mm. so it's just one of those things that like wow, um. It's a very shitty situation to be in, uh, and 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 why? And that's maybe that's what I mean. If anything, maybe you know when 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 your parents warn you about you know going out and to parties, big parties, and all this kind of thing. Uh, yeah, there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of dangers beyond just drugs and alcohol and all that that you need to be aware of. Like, like just big crowds can be dangerous as well. Yeah, man. Oh, yeah. yeah, man. It's it has to be a part of the regular warning, already. Big crowds. Uh, Big, big crowds. crowds anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The strangers. Right. Always listen uh, listen to the bouncer. Uh, listen to the bouncer when he doesn't he he's thinking for your safety also, you know. Yeah. Tell yourself yeah. that. Tell yourself that each time yeah. you get kicked out. Yeah. Um <laughs> but yeah, man. It is uh morbid, scary, and yeah, like I can't imagine like even the the feeling in soul now, man. Yeah. Condolences to all the Families, uh, you know, yeah, families have been affected and like, kids, oh yeah. my god, I mean, I, I can't crazy. imagine something like something like that, lah. Of course, a lot of the a lot of the deaths of young people, like obviously, yeah. because they were the the majority of the people there were probably very young. Uh, so yeah, it's just and then the crazy crazy way to for a life to be ended like that, lah. Yeah, and then the morgues are overflowing, so I think there's like makeshift morgues on the street. So mm. basically, parents of teenagers have to. Yeah, it's just it's just terrible, terrible, mm-hmm. terrible. Yeah, yeah, man. So Mm-mm-mm. yeah, I mean, not gonna have a funny segue or anything to our, our next topic, lah. I think we can. Yeah, we 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 just do have on. another topic that is also a uh, interesting topic, but not related to this. Yes. Thankfully. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that topic is almost like um from a different different world, different <laughs> aspect of life. Yeah. Uh. Not the most accessible aspect to a certain extent, mm. but mm. it is the chatter around um a certain T Rex fossil that is currently in Singapore. I think mm. currently in Singapore, yeah. um, it is a full tyr- Tyrannosaurus Rex skeleton that is on display, um, in Singapore till at, at the Victoria Concert Theatre and Concert Hall from Friday until Sunday. It's done already, um, right? Oh, it's done already. Yeah, it was, it this was past here weekend. from Friday until Sunday. Yeah. Until uh and then now it's on the way to a Hong few Kong. different auctions. Yeah, yeah, by Christie's in Hong Kong, Geneva, and New York. Mm-hmm. So I mean the estimated value of the skeleton is between US fifteen to twenty five million. Mm. Uh so so just to reiterate that, that means it's gonna be auctioned at Christie's, which is mm. a famous auction house. To anyone who is willing to pay that money. Means yeah. it might not be a museum, it might not be a school, it might not yeah. be an institution, it might be a fucking individual. Wait, correction, uh, you um, said it's going to yeah. it's, it's going to Hong Kong next, uh, right? Yes. And and it's gonna be auctioned off in Hong Kong November thirtieth. Oh, uh. correct, correct. Yeah, it's not it's not yeah, really, it's yeah. not doing a tour or anything, like uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, correct. Hong Kong, Hong Kong. Yes, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. Hong Kong. Uh, okay, it's just that I think it's, it was used as a preview for upcoming Christie's auctions in Hong Kong, Geneva and New York but this mm, particular mm, mm. specimen will be uh, in Hong Kong only yeah, and we auctioned off but, by the end of November I believe yeah correct and I mean over the weekend there were crowds of Singaporeans who went to see it's quite a majestic piece like, it's huge mm, but mm. why is there controversy Terrence? Uh, I think the controversy is uh, about when when something as complete like this, uh, when such a complete T Rex uh, fossil is auctioned off, and it can be auctioned to anyone like, like institutions, private collectors, whatever. Uh, there are a lot of people in the scientific community who are worried that it's it's gone forever la. It means that scientists will not have access to it, and and it's up to the private collectors, uh, you know, their own um, 
it's up to them whether they want to put it out for the public to see whether they want to like, allow scientists access to it. So it might be gone forever if after this auction already, such an important piece of uh, ancient history. Yeah, and I mean it, it's a it's a huge uh, uh piece. It's twelve point two meters long, four point six meters high, and weighs mm. about a thousand four hundred uh kilograms. Mm. Um, and this Tyrannosaurus Rex, uh, I mean, since it's a T Rex, it would have lived sixty six to sixty eight million years ago yeah. and was unearthed in Montana in twenty twenty. Yeah. So so, I think I first understood that oh shit there are private collectors of dinosaur fossils was when a few years ago when we went to the Nas- National History Museum at natural, NUS Natural History Museum Natural uh, yeah. nat- Natural History Museum which is something we have spoken about uh, on previous podcasts as well about how yeah. awesome and how unknown it is yeah. um, and our common friend there who who works there has a, what, what aspect of the museum uh? Uh, he's uh, one of the curators I think yeah Ah, one of the curators. Yeah. He was the one who mentioned that, yeah, you know, dinosaur bones, um, there's a lot that are just in like the living room of some tycoon. Mm, mm. People, they buy it for like 3 million. Of course, it might not be a T-Rex. Uh, I don't know, like a, like a smaller dinosaur. They buy it, like, you know, rich people, they, you, you can imagine now, they buy uh, paintings, they buy vases, yeah. they buy, I don't know, chandeliers. There are people who are so rich that they buy dinosaur fossils yeah. as a flex. Yeah. For this were we talking homes. about this on the previous podcast? Uh, we were, I no, think we were uh. talking about museum antiquities. Uh. Antiquities. Ah, yeah. okay, okay. But, but yeah, so, so where do you stand on this? Uh? Um, I think, yeah, like, like what you said, uh, it's quite unknown to everyone about the interplay between auction houses, uh, private collectors, uh, you know, public institutions, and fossil hunters. Uh. So, I I mean I I just did some reading and some some research into all the things that 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 go on in that world and it seems like um you know I think this whole trend of of auctioning off dinosaurs started way back almost twenty twenty plus years ago in nineteen ninety seven like when the first the most complete uh at, at that point in time the most complete T Rex uh skeleton was I think sold by sold by one of the auction houses. For over over eight million dollars, eight million US dollars, and that mm. kicked off that whole this whole wave of like um you know fossil hunters and and you know putting all these dino- dinosaur fossils up for auction and all and be- prior to that auction actually apparently dinosaur uh, fossils and all you, you know they would go in the six figure range uh, it wouldn't cross one million dollars uh, it would be like a couple hundred thousand dollars and things like that. So that was the first time the real, you know, where it became a real commercial activity, the act of actually auctioning and, and auctioning off a, a full dinosaur fossil and, and you know, that exciting private collectors, exciting the fossil hunters who, who you know, they, they, they almost exist like modern day Indiana Jones. Are they, they have their own teams of people. They have their own uh, excavators and things like that and tools to... And they go out to places like, uh, you know, Jordan, Montana, and all that to actually find these fossil uh, dinosaur fossils. Uh. And after they get them, you know, they 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 know how to do their own cleanup of the fossils. They know how to do all these little, little things that you think that you would think that only museums or or public institutions would know uh, know how to do uh. But because they are able to monetize the fossils, right, that actually pays for them to be able to to take better care of the the fossils that they find later, uh. So there's a very um, interesting interplay between all these different uh, parties in the in the whole process, la. And and I think a lot of the the criticism from the scientific community is that it should be these fossils are very important for science and for the general public to see, and they should be in public institutions like museums and and uh, you know like the Natural History Museum, for example. It should be there for people to admire, la, and for scientists who want to study them to just walk in and be able to study them. Lah. Um, whereas if it goes to a private collector, you really don't know how they will take care of it. You don't know if they will give scientists mm. access to it. Um, and that's why they are, you know, there's some criticism of what's going on here with this T-Rex uh, fossil as well. Because it's going to be auctioned off for a huge sum of money that might be even out of reach for a lot of uh, public institutions. Uh, as much money as they have, lah, right? And it will mm. it will rely if anything it will rely on the strength of uh 
donors and 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 the governments to actually uh step in if they want to acquire these these uh, fossils for their for the museum collections. Uh. So it's yeah. it's gonna be tough la, unless you get a private collector who buys it and after that, you know, loans it to a museum or something. But there's no guarantee that that will happen. Uh. And and just to add on to you, like what uh what you said about what what was the first time a dinosaur uh, collection reached that value. You didn't talk about DiCaprio, right? And and no, how no. he was in the news for that. No, no. So apparently in 2019, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio and Nicolas Cage entered into a bidding war over a $276,000 dinosaur skull. Mm, mm, yeah. Yeah. So so I think he was one of the first celebrities to like publicly like be seen as like a collector of dinosaur bones, like, which mm. is kind of contradictory to his whole save the environment kind of persona. Right? <laughs> or maybe for him, he's like, he's saving he's the saving, environment uh, this way. Yeah, yeah. He's saving the environment. But but I think, yeah, when when our friend at the Natural History Museum told us about it and and when this article came out, it, it like what Terrence said, there's a lot of things that go on in the, in, in the behind the scenes. Like, and mm. this article from 2019 also says, you know, if one were looking to get into dinosaur fossil collecting, it'd be better to start with vegetarians since carnivore dinosaurs have a reportedly higher price tag, mm. a medium-sized Diplodocus goes for just five hundred thousand euros to one million, mm. while the uh, Triceratops can be purchased for one hundred fifty thousand to three hundred fifty thousand. Yeah. But if it's a Velociraptor, it can be like three million and upwards. Yeah. So there's a whole market for fucking dinosaur bones, and I think like in countries like the US, if a fossil mm. is found on private land, you are yeah. free to do anything you want, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're free to take it, yeah. You're free to do anything you want. And then you can engage like a fossil digging company to mm. come dig it up and then you can share whatever profits that you can glean from that. Yeah. And that sounds, wow, that sounds ridiculous, man. Yeah. But what do you think of the the ethics of all that, of auctioning off, uh, you know, putting the something that is, that is uh, you know, very important to the scientific community, very important to the general public, I also find. What do you think of that? being auctioned off to a private collector. Like, I mean, you know, in a capitalist world, we think that, okay, as long as you've got the money to do it, like, why should it, and it doesn't affect other people, why should we care? But what do you think about that? I don't like the idea. La. I why, don't uh? think it should be sold off to private investors. Why? Private, uh? private, well, because, how you say, uh, uh, I don't know, I don't know how to articulate it, but it just feels wrong. That means you're so saying, it, what, it I should mean, be regulated or, or something? Yeah, like, okay, if you carbon date any fossil that you find and it's more than, like, a million years old, you fuck off as an individual uh, buyer. You fuck mm, off mm, mm. and no individual person can own this because it is a public good. Mm, mm. Uh, or, or, or something something like that. La. But I don't know how to quantify it because if you find a diamond, mm, right? Mm. Uh, I don't know the intricacies, but I assume if you happen to find a diamond, it's yours, la, right? Yeah, yeah. So what, what makes a fossil different? Hmm. Mm. I don't know. But what were you? What will your answer be? Um, I th- yeah, I think one thing to note is that what I've I've heard or read up about is that the yeah, the US is one of these few places where if you find something that is like almost like a national treasure, uh, you know, like if you find it on your private land, it's yours, right? So so like dinosaur bones. You really were, buy the land, you buy yeah, the history, you yeah, buy everything. You buy everything, right? like, yeah. So uh yeah, US is one of the few places where it's like they you know they I don't know what the exact uh law is or but they don't designate that all oh, these are national treasures that can't be exported out of the country, like for example. Because that's something you could do, right? You could say that if there are any fossils, like what you say, if, if dated back to beyond this time, uh they are considered national treasures and they can't be exported out of the country for commercial purposes and all that, right? You could mm. lose things like that, but the US doesn't. Uh, so it becomes like, yeah, like, you're literally a cowboy town where this Cowboys are going around digging up, um, digging out these fossils and, and selling them for huge, 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 huge profit, la. Um, but then at the same time, some like there's a very interesting video that I saw about this whole practice where one of the professors in in these public institutions were talking about saying that, um, I mean he'd rather he'd rather there be these dinosaur hunters and and fossil hunters and digging these things up for auction. Then leaving just leaving all the fossils out there, uh, mm. in the open, uh. because you leave them the open, like it's not necessary that they're ever gonna be they're ever gonna be dug up by a public institution or something, you know. Like, um, in fact, it maybe it's because 
the auctioning of these of these uh, fossils actually generates revenue and income. That's why there are all these uh, private fossil hunters who will take the effort to go and dig up all these all these things. Mm-hmm. And to them, to him, is as long as the the process of digging up is ethical in that it's not from you know stolen from public land or it's not uh the the way they do it is not uh destroying the bone and 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 and, and things like that. Um, you know why 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 should they stop it Because like? the public institutions are it's gonna take them donkey years to raise the money to to buy these things mm. or to even dig up these things. So why not just let commercial interests handle it? And at least at least the the fossil is out of the of you know away from whether it can be preserved. Even if it's sitting in someone's private collection, it's it's there la, You know, such that that one day you know it can be it might be taken up for for, for by a public institution to be displayed and all la. So so he's saying Whoa. that it's, this is just the reality of life. It's here to stay. Uh, and rather than fight it and, and hope that the public institutions can get more money to, to do these kind of things, why not let private collectors do it and and hope that these private collectors can also be uh can also lend it to them. Lah. Yeah. Oh, I mean what wow, that is a yeah. that is a good point, which is I mean it's the yeah like like you can imagine if this is solely for government institutions and non-profits and museums mm. well allow it you need money to dig shit up right yeah exactly you need yeah. money if it's not powered by money it'll be fucking slow mm. holy mm. shit that's a good point because at first I was like oh doesn't this sound like you know those game uh, those game reserves where you can you pay $50,000 to kill one lion mm. but that $50,000 mm. goes a long way to protect like 10 other lions yeah, yeah. you know so so but this one is like uh these things if no one's digging them up we might not even have discovered like an even bigger dinosaur or something yeah, yeah. right or even a new species that we've never heard of and if you power it by money wow mm, mm. oh, that's that is a good point yeah i mean the wow. and i think uh you know like these fossils will last for for i mean they've lasted of 66 million years, like, right? And the hope is that mm. they will last beyond, you know, the life of the, even the person who owns them as well, like, right? And somewhere along the way, hopefully, it gets, it's allowed to, that the public will have access or, or scientists will have access to it, like, so, you know, it's, it's, in some ways, I can see, maybe this is where commercial, commercial uh, diggers and commercial hunters or fossils might actually have a role to play in unearthing a lot more of these treasures for for the humanity to to enjoy la. Don't not enjoy, but to, for humanity to study and, and look at la. Mm. But I guess yeah. that's one of those things that always sounds good on paper, right? But you never know mm. the actual actual repercussions and actual truth. La. Because you know, there's mm. like the moment I say trickle down economics, confirm people listening to this, half of them will be like, Yeah, it works. The yeah. other half will be like, fuck that shit. You yeah. Know? Yeah. But on paper, it makes sense. La. On paper it makes so, sense. La. But the next thing you know, maybe Leonardo DiCaprio is like He's like sitting on yeah. the dinosaur fossil, have drinking alcohol, you know, and have partying. Or, you know? <laughs> or he's working with institutions that actually want to do research oh, and yeah. he's using his funds yeah. and pulling funds among rich people to yeah. buy back this, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. Why am I, why am I you like, can always, laughing about it? Because <laughs> it sounds yeah, like such a, right. sounds like something like, it sounds very doubtful to me, but okay, we'll just entertain that. No, also because... That. <laughs> Because Leonardo DiCaprio played this character on Django Unchained, right? Where and Unchained, mm. you know, the, the Quentin Tarantino, Tarantino movie, where there's this, there's that scene of him talking about like a, a certain human skull of a certain race that is yeah. less evolved, like a yeah, very yeah, chilling yeah. scene, la. It is a very chilling scene. La. I remember that. But yeah, I mean the wow. the thing is in Singapore we do have di- dinosaur bones in our uh, dinosaur fossils in our natural history museum as well, like, right? Mm. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, we do. I think um actually there's a lot of people, I think a lot of Singaporeans who themselves who haven't visited the Natural History Museum. Uh I've mm. been a couple of times and it's always an awesome thing. And and yeah, they, they if you want dinosaurs, there are dinosaurs there also. So if you missed out on this T Rex tree, yeah. Yeah, if you missed out on yeah. this T Rex, there's still dinosaur uh bones in Singapore. Uh, so you can check them out there. Uh. Yeah, it's so such an underrated place, man. You go there, it's not crowded. Um, uh, maybe like people listening to this podcast, they they go there, it starts getting traction. It'll be great because it really is a fucking awesome place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's surprising to see it in Singapore. Yeah, but if you where does the dinosaur fossils rank on your 
on your oh, uh, hi, hi, hi. bucket list. La. Like, you know, like if you had just like, if you're a billionaire and you have like a lot of money to or spend. To buy, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Where would they rank? Would, oh, would, you, mean, buy, would you buy Twitter first or would you buy Dinosaur Fossil? Uh, no, la, you cannot compare Twitter and Dinosaur <laughs> Fossil. Like, maybe you compare Dinosaur Fossil and like a piece of like art or or mm. something like physical also. La. Yeah. I would say Dinosaur Fossils, to be honest, fucking high up there. Mm, higher than a Picasso or fucking something. Confirm. Confirm. confirm uh. Why? Uh? You think about it. You think about it, that bone that you're looking at, right? Yeah. has been around for 66 million years. No? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct, 66 correct. million years. You yeah. know, if someone who's 66 years old, we say, oh, you know, that guy's not young. He's been like, like a long, long life. Imagine living that life a million times. Mm-hmm. and that's how old that bone is la. and yeah, I think yeah. that's the appeal la. but yeah. for you uh, I mean yeah the dinosaur bones are awesome but I, I feel like in Singapore's weather uh, it's so hard to keep the dinosaur it's probably so hard to keep the dinosaur bones uh, like you know intact and everything in Singapore's humidity la, right fuck so, like if you can afford you... dinosaur bones <laughs> you think what they're going to leave it in their like living room with a ceiling fan or something uh? you never know la. maybe but but no <laughs> fuck but la, no la. you you will need to build a whole like uh, you know a whole facility that is like uh, dehumidified and everything to keep the dinosaur bones yeah, in a I'm, good condition uh, I'm pretty sure in some GCB in Singapore <laughs> there's at least one dinosaur bone there confirm oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm willing to put a bet on it yeah, yeah. I, I've some seen, GCB in Singapore yeah. uh. I've seen you can buy T-Rex teeth on, on, on all these like auction sites at like Christie's and Sotheby's you can buy T-Rex oh, teeth for like, like I think 20,000 pounds or something uh. so, so it is highly possible that there are a lot of these uh, you know teeth and other smaller fragments in private collectors rooms in Singapore uh. but I'm talking about like mm. one giant T-Rex you know one giant whole T-Rex uh, skeleton uh, like how is that just finding space in Singapore to fit it is wow yeah you have to have a GCB uh, Singapore, and above, uh. Singapore <laughs> a bit hard uh. yeah Singapore a bit hard or maybe yeah. the person who buys that Shenton Way penthouse you mm. know, they put it right at the top in a glass case wow wow yeah. la, eh. that'll be just the bringing, ultimate flex right here but bringing everything up is another uh, I guess you could bring it in yeah, money yeah, la, yeah, bro yeah, yeah, yeah you just use helicopter and helicopter all helicopter and fly in yeah 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 yeah, That's crazy. you see four helicop- helicopters carry the Singapore flag. They just carry these dinosaur bones also. <laughs> la. Confirm again. Wow. Confirm again. Put them at the top of the building. It'd be such a flex Ultimate to like... Ultimate flex. Yeah, to fly the Ultimate. dinosaur dinosaur bones past like people's windows on yeah. like National Day. Then like any plane that's landing just as it's about to land, you look, you can see in the far distance Shenton Way building like dinosaur <laughs> up at the top of the building. <laughs> wow, wow. Eh. Ultimate be, flex. Uh, you make an awesome uh, property limb brothers video. Uh. Yeah, exactly, exactly, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right. Property limb, yeah. But yeah. cool, man. Uh, cool. So, what is cool. your one short comment for this uh, this episode? <laughs> uh, <laughs> my one short comment is uh something on Reddit mm. that was posted by <laughs> Majestic Economist Six. Mm. Um, and the user was just a little, little tickled uh, that our last episode was sponsored by Mindef. Mm, mm, mm. And the title of the post literally is Whoa, YLB sponsored by Mindef. And then the user is trying to wrap their head around why in the world Mindef would advertise on us given the nature of our content, the nature of our uh, vulgarities, the nature of our critiques on politics and all that. Mm, mm. So, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, so like I just found it interesting. Um, and I mean, like, I, I, I will say that the people that we've worked with at Mindef, I mean, they, they do see the value in podcasts. Mm. And if coming from an organization like that, they're willing to take a chance on podcasts, I would say kudos to that, kudos to them, man, for trying it out. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. it's uh, anyone who's, uh, anybody who's advertising a podcast now is probably a bit ahead of the game, like, I would say. Uh, it's yeah, because it's yeah. still a very it's still quite a new medium uh, and it really reminds me I've mentioned this a lot of times it really reminds me of the early days of YouTube as well like when people are like huh why, why would I bother mm. to use to advertise on YouTube and things like that you know when I can just like mm. uh, do my own things on my own website and all so so yeah in those in that sense um, yeah don't be surprised uh, there are some very forward thinking people even in large organizations who who are ahead of the curve in terms of this kind of uh, thinking about the marketing plans uh? Yeah, I mean, we have had Dr. Janil on the podcast. 
we will be having another um how you say uh, distinguished guests uh in the coming weeks on our podcast mm-hmm. so um so i mean it's cool uh, because we never hold back from any opinions we have on about the government and its policies um mm. but if they are willing to kind of like explore the world of podcast by all means come on man yeah yeah that's right come on yeah yeah, yeah. what about you man what was your one shook your one um, shook comment my one shook thing was by iced milo who i think on our last podcast talking about ghosting uh sent the meme i think it was a meme or just a picture about a halloween costume that was literally uh you know a, a, what you see as a typical ghost but with some um ghosting text if you know what i mean a ghosting conversation text on the on the ghost sheet la, on the white sheet of the ghost of the ghost la. so i mean yeah yeah mm. I'll, I'll put a link to the meme but it's actually pretty funny and pretty relevant to the idea of talking about ghosting during halloween season as well la. Mm, I see, I see. Yeah. Uh right. and, and it's it's on Reddit la. Yeah, yeah, it's on Reddit. That's right. So yeah, my one shook thing this time is uh on something that uh you know you can't find a lot of resources for in Singapore, I find. Uh it's actually uh an Instagram account that a Japanese Instagram account that teaches men how to style clothes for everyday situations. Uh, men in their twenties and thirties are uh, specifically. It's because I think when a lot of times when you look up styling for men and all. A lot of it is they're very inaccessible stuff like, you know, tailoring a suit, la, wearing these things that probably only influencers would wear and, and it's just impractical to wear in a place like Singapore. La. But this um, Instagram account called Hayama.mensfashion uh, and apparently they are, it's run by the shop staff of Adastria underscore official. I'm not sure what that is. La. It's probably a clothing brand or a magazine or something in uh, in Japan. But they do this literal... Um, like Instagram stories, uh, Instagram posts with pictures and then with Japanese and English versions of the pictures where they literally tell you how to style one particular piece of uh, clothing. Like uh, the, the their latest post is of the denim jacket and they give two types of styling. One for, you know, a bit more daily kind of wear, another one for like probably more winter kind of wear. And uh, yeah, they do this for all types of men's uh, uh, accessory, uh, fashion items uh, like chino pants, uh, you know, the um, the vests, plate shirts, military jackets. So each of this has their own in- Instagram post with two uh, looks on how you can can layer it and make it look fashionable. Uh. So uh, I think it's quite interesting because they, they, you know, like I think one of the things that is very cool about Japan is they have a very strong culture of um, understanding, understanding, uh, uh, you know, whether it's an art form or a fashion co- or a certain piece of culture, really understanding and studying it. And then subsequently, they they break it down into steps to teach others how to appreciate it, how to, uh, uh, how to you know, uh, pay tribute to it, how to interpret it for your for yourself in Japanese uh, culture and Japanese weather. La. So in this case, it's, it's quite cool that, uh, you know, there's a lot of things when I go to Uniqlo, I'm like, oh, this looks pretty cool. But I, like, I cannot imagine how I would wear it or or how in Singapore I could possibly pull this off or, you know, with my, the way I look and everything, like how to, you know, the silhouette, that, whether it fits me and all. But looking at this, this these instructional, like, um, posts on Instagram by Hayama.mensfashion uh, makes me, oh, okay, that's pretty cool. I, I could try this look. I could try that look and, and maybe be a bit more adventurous with what we wear like, compared to the, the usual shirt and shirt and berms and flip flops that we do in Singapore, lah. Oh, is it? Wow. Yeah. That is always a useful resource, man. It is. It is, and I, I think... like it because it's not. It's just to the point. They don't have that whole, you know, you read articles and all that top ten this and all that, and then after that, nine of them are useless, useless points, and only one is maybe useful for styling. This one is just okay. Here's this look, and this is how you do it. You know, pam pam pam, and that. Oh. Or like nine suits every man should have. Yeah, Twelve I... shoes. <laughs> That every yeah. guy should have. Then then I'm like, fuck you, lah. Yeah. If I can buy twelve shoes, <laughs> seven suits, yeah. uh, fifteen pants, I'm exactly. like, yeah, like I don't need style advice, man. Yeah, yeah. Right. And if you're like, and like, like uh, honestly, like a suit in Singapore, lah, right? A suit in Singapore. Yeah. Just like a lot of times, it just doesn't make sense. So there's so much other things, to, other aspects of fashion and other fashion items that men can also. Uh, wear and engage in and, and, and you know put in a little bit more effort la, than just the usual la. and uh, that's why that's why I think this this site is, uh, this 
Instagram account is quite useful. Mm, mm. Yeah. Wow, I mean, for okay. you, I'm sure like you're learning a lot as you as you're doing your wedding suit and all that as well, right? Because you got to think about no. things like how you're complimenting your fiance and all in terms of her wedding dress uh, and all that, right? Yeah, the suit is the least of the concerns. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, actually, don't know, actually, like some of them are still like in the mail and shit like mm-hmm. that at uh, some parts. So, I mean, no, 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 it wouldn't say least of the concerns. It is a concern. No, but it's it less cannot, about. But it cannot be the least of concerns because how you look will affect how your how your the bride looks. No, so. I say least of the concerns right now because we have already decided what we are wearing. Oh, okay, so okay, okay. it's coming on the way. Oh, we have way. we have worked through that already. Yeah, so right. working through that, what exactly to wear and all that. Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. that was a an like, interesting process. But now there's the more nitty gritties of things that are still yet to be decided that we need to decide, lah. Mm, got it, got it. Okay. But yeah, you yeah, don't mind man. if I if I attend your wedding, uh, you know, something a bit more funky than just a a boring ass. Suit Dude, or something go like. ahead, la. <laughs> Go ahead, man. Feel yeah. free, man. Yeah, you check out the Instagram free, account. Yeah. I'll, I'll come. I'll come in one of those, one of those like K-pop, uh, K-pop you vests say, or something. <laughs> you say you better come like that. You better yeah, come yeah, like yeah. that. It'd be quite cool. Yes. What is your one shop thing? Okay. My one true thing is is an article that I chanced upon I think a few days ago that it is quite somber, but mm. I thought it's a uh, it made me think uh or like a re re how you say a reflect la. and mm. the title of the article okay so the article is written by someone who has worked a lot in palliative care which yep. is end of life care mm. Mm. and the article is called regrets of the dying mm. so she wrote a book um about her conversations with people just. Once you're in a palliative home, you are end of near your end of life, la, right? Mm, so, yeah. I know you always hear peop- uh, stories of like um, uh, what people say on their deathbed, and some of them are uh, you have heard before, you know, like um, mm. uh, I never worked so hard and stuff like that. So this one, I one never of the five so things is, what do you mean? No, I wish I I wish uh, I hadn't worked so hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. So this one also it's there, but some I mean the 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 five uh, essentially was okay. Number two is I wish I hadn't worked so hard. Number one is, I wish I had the courage to live a life true to myself and not mm. the life others expected of me. Mm. So according to her, this was the most common regret of all. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. And and just, yeah, like the, the next one was like, I wish I had the courage to express my feelings. I wish I had stayed in touch with my friends and I wish I had let myself be happier. So it's a short article. Um, mm. I mean, she has a full book that called The Top 5 Regrets of the Dying. But when I read this article, I was like, hmm, I was having kopi in the morning and I was like, wow, that was a, that was deep, man. And it just mm, makes you mm. stop and think. La. Stop mm, and think. Mm. And I think it's important, like every once in a while, you read something that makes you go like, hmm, mm. that's interesting. So yeah. that's, your, that's your morning reading. Uh. No, because every morning, like I got a few bookmarks of, uh, of, of like uh, websites or forums that I go to see whether I got any interesting articles or something. La. Okay, okay. Does she it's have a, a, you said she so, has a book out as well. Yeah, she has a book. It's called The Top 5 Regrets of Dying. Her name mm. is Bronnie Ware. Bronnie Ware. Interesting. Yeah, but I read this. I was like, ooh, damn. It's a short article, but uh, I saved it. Lah. Mm. So, so yeah, it's a bit it's a bit more somber, but always worth uh, reflecting every once in a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's, uh, yeah, in this, in, uh, in a week like this, probably it's, uh, it's something worth, worth reading or so. Lah. Yeah, man. Appreciate life while you have it, man. Mm, that's right. Appreciate life while you have it. Yeah. But yeah. Cool, man. Cool. The, All right. Uh, the start of uh, start of another week, but the end of October. And, oh, and yeah, uh, end of October, man. Pretty <sighs> shitty Halloween Two for months. everyone. But well, here we go. Yeah. Two months till the end of 2022. All right. Yep. Thanks for listening, everybody. <laughs>